All right. So what's up, YouTube? This is Dennis Panuta for tutorials.eu. Today I'm here with Lars Holdgaard. I think that's, I hope I pronounced it correctly, right? All right. You did a and great job. Thank you very much. And he is the CTO of the company called Liquido. And uh, he's going to answer a couple of questions that we prepared. And he's uh, a very interesting person when it comes to um, a bunch of different topics. You will see during this interview because I uh, investigated a little bit and I'm super hyped to have a, this conversation with you and the, having the interview. So thanks a lot for taking the time and uh, sharing your knowledge with me as well as with the uh, viewers of this video. And thanks for allowing me to come up, of course. All right, cool. So um, I have prepared a bunch of questions. I'm just going to ask one uh, after the other. And along the way, I will also, of course, uh, freestyle a little bit if there is something specific that interests me during the uh, <laughs> statement that you gave or however you answered. So first of all, could you please introduce yourself a bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Lars. I'm 31 years old, uh, born and uh, yeah, born in Denmark. Uh, and I mean, I have always, you know, really just wanted to build companies since I was a child, uh, always been entrepreneurial, playing around. So I'm a very happy uh, man, love, loves adventure, love life, and love building companies. And about myself, I have, I have a technical background. I learned to code uh, as one of the first things I did in high school. Uh, I was one of these nerds, you know, selling websites, building stuff there. And then that has been my journey ever since. All right. So basically you started at school to sell your own websites already, uh, develop websites for people? Yeah, so Exactly. So, I mean, I have, you know, uh, when I was like in high school, 15 years old, uh, we had this course in school where we had the Colons program uh, and I took that course. Uh, and I think everyone else in the class just wanted to, you know, dig into the technical side, but I, I wanted money. Uh, and I, I, I got the opportunity to learn that and I started selling websites right away. And of course they sucked. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was more cared about the business side of it. But then I realized, you know, that, uh, you know, you really, if, if you learned more of the technical side, it was becoming really good. So that's basically how I, I started out there. I always like had a, I always liked the, the, the mix of business and the commercial side of it, but also mixing with technical. All right. So if somebody was searching for someone who is uh, super young, but already has like five years of experience or whatever, then you would be the guy, right? Would have been the guy. Yeah, basically. but I think... But I think it, it's funny, you know, I, I, you, you often attract, you know, the people in your life that is a little bit similar to yourself. So we were a group of friends doing that. So I think in my friends group, it's been quite normal doing that. I've always been around people who, you know, wanted to sell some things and, and, and build things. So it's, it's been pretty common in my friends group, I think. All right. That's cool. Yeah, that's definitely motivating because then, I mean, you, you can, uh, well, if you have the same mindset, you can build something together in the future, potentially. So the person that you build a exactly. uh, Liquido with, is it one of your friends from childhood? No, no Liquido happened like much, much, much later. And, and that was through uh, a friend much later. Um, I think starting out my, uh, I mean, I, I started with many of these like small, stupid ideas, like selling websites, which is stupid. But, you know, it, I didn't know what we're doing anyway. I mean, I just found some people and, and, and sold some stuff. And I think the first many years, that was uh, that was it. And I think uh, then it became gradually more and more. Like, I built one of the biggest student websites in Denmark uh, that got 5,000 visitors a day and, and also sold that later. And and I basically took that. It was much, much later. I, I met my current co-founder, uh, Max. Uh, that was, like, when I was uh, living as digital nomad, which we can come to. But I was traveling in the world and uh, I met him through a friend and, you know, I met him there. All right. Digital nomad. So uh, I'm going to just cling on to question, uh, points that you just said. And, yeah. Uh, because uh, digital, digital nomad would be something that I would ask a lot later. But can you tell me a little more about the digital nomad lifestyle that you, um, well, how did you come to live it and how was it? And how could you make money uh, living anywhere, basically? Yeah, sure. So... so so my situation was that I, while studying at university, I had all these projects uh, and, and I ran uh, this website, uh, Go Kaktia, which means good grades decay, that, that was really got, becoming really big. And then I also ran a web shop on the site uh, selling uh, boys, like, like toys for small babies. And I didn't, I don't have any, any kids, so that was very stupid. It should sell something you know about. Um, but I, I had these projects uh, and, and then, you know, I just realized, you know, I didn't earn like a lot of money. So I, I sold them uh, and then I started getting a real job. Uh, so someone uh, took 23-year-old 23, 23 Lars out of college, hiring him. 
gave him a ton of responsibility uh, in a, in one of the biggest Danish web shops called Saxo. Uh, and there I you know, basically worked my ass off. And then after a year, I realized, you know, they really need me. They are dependent on me. So why not, ab like, not abuse, but why not take that to my advantage? So I decided to become a freelancer. I went into the office saying, hey, I love working here, but how about I become a freelancer and you double my salary? And they say, <laughs> and they said, no, you can just fuck off. But one of the, 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 the guys that hired me, uh, and it was a different team, they said, we need Lars. Uh, and, and they basically, you know, we, we need, to, need to have him. Uh, and then I got a contract, uh, not the double salary I wanted, uh, but I, I got a, a pretty good increase. And then suddenly I had a contract. I, I was a freelancer, right? Uh, I could do what the F I wanted. Uh, and that's how I got started on that, that journey, because I basically had that one customer. And when you have one customer, it's easy to get number two, number three, and so forth. That's how I started. All right. Well, the, the zero from zero to one is the hardest part, right? Exactly. And then, you know, when you first have one, you also have a little bit, you know, capital to do start things. I earned uh, like, you know, 15,000 euros a month from that contract. Uh, and then I just, for instance, as an attempt, I sent out like a thousand letters to Danish companies. And then suddenly I got a few more clients. And then I started hiring some uh, Russian developers. And then suddenly I had a small team. And that was like how I got started as a digital nomad. Wow. All right. So old school letters, paper, written, or how did you do that? Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that was my hack, you know. I mean, everyone okay. needs a hack to get started. And, and I, I, I wanted to stand out. So I just, I, I found a website where you can, like, send letters. Um, uh, so I just you know, went in and basically, they yeah, send a thousand physical old school letters, cost me a thousand euros. I got, like, three meetings, closed three of them. And, and th that is always worth it. Uh, it costs money to make money, right? Uh, yeah. And that, 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 that's how it is. Well, um, that's... Fun side story. One of, one, of, one of my best friends, you know, he needed a job. So he sent out 500 physical letters to different companies got sent job into use and, and got a really well-paying job. I mean, it, it's, it's standing out, it always works. All right. Yeah. Um, if a million people watch this video, then potentially this will not be a good idea anymore. <laughs> if there are a million people sending out a uh, thousand find, But finally the, new, finally the new next idea will be, right? I mean, yeah. it's all about you know, being creative. That's like how you, how you make, a, make a thing in the world, right? You, not, not, not copy people, you do something new. Yeah, of course. So, um, that's uh, that it always changes of course i mean letters are definitely something that um even now is like physical letters are really something that's pretty cool actually like to get a physical letter it feels so different to an email right and or a whatsapp message or whatever yeah, exactly yeah all right so digital nomad where did you go first like what was the country that you were most interested in when when you got the opportunity so a little bit backstory. Uh, I mean, uh, during uh, college, I went quite a lot to Asia. Uh, my uncle, he is, was living in Hong Kong. Uh, so I had my first adventure there being 21 years old. Um, so I just got back to, I wanted to get back to Asia. So I, I took the, the most classical, the most like what everyone does. Of course, I went to Chiang Mai in Thailand. I mean, of course, that's like the rule. You have to go there. Today, it's Bali that is popular. But back then, it was Chiang Mai. Uh, and I went there. And then I realized everyone was a travel blogger and I moved far away. I, 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 I mean, I needed someone really ambitious that wanted to make the big money around me. So then I went to, to Hong Kong again. I went to Singapore. I wanted these like these more, you know, very ambitious places. I spent a while in Makati in Philippines, which like had a really, really cool startup scene. So basically going around the startup ecosystem in Southeast Asia, but in the ambitious places because I couldn't stand the travel bloggers. Nothing against them because there's a lot of them out there. And I think it's great for a period, but I... I, I, I want to build something huge and no offense travel bloggers uh, that in Chiang Mai there was, used to be a lot of that there. I see. Okay. Well, yeah, that's also something why I came back from, from Malaga because it felt like retirement already, you know, like felt a little bit like, exactly. oh yeah, this is the chill life. And if you want to achieve something bigger, then it's good to be surrounded by people who also want that, right? And then you get that in specific yeah. areas more than in others, right? All right, so when were you in Hong Kong? What time? Oh, first time in 11. Uh, I spent quite a lot while there in 13 and 14. Uh, and so, so before all these problems that there, there is now. Um, so around 13, 14. Okay, and um, were you, but uh, is it possible that you were around uh, there in 2011? Yeah, I was there. Because we could have met there potentially. I was there for, uh, for an, a semester <laughs> nice. for four months and uh, oh, was God. really appreciating I mean, the time, yeah. I think the amazing thing about Hong Kong is how sheer ambitious it is. I mean, if you walk in a street in New York, 
people walk fast. You people, you know, they are so ambitious. There's this energy going on. You have the exact same thing in Hong Kong. Everyone is ruthless. They're walking fast. If you stand that way, they'll crush you. And you know, you can hate that, but I fucking love it. I love this energy in that city. A little bit like same in Singapore. You have same in Paris, London. Man, like I talk about, I mean, it's great for sleeping. It's great for going to the beach, but you're not gonna make the billions there. I mean, that yeah. is why uh, I don't like it there. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Maybe when you're 60. <laughs> when you're 60 and you have a Ferrari, you can drive around. That's gonna be cool, right? But not before. All right. So, uh, can you tell me a little more about uh, Liquido? So, how did it come about, and um, how did it grow? Because now you're 50 people, right? You, uh, as I read. And how did it exactly. happen, basically? You are now you're CTO of this highly IT-based uh, company, right? Let, let me actually tell a different story first, because that explains the computer, and it's a really, really good story with lots of learnings there, I think, uh, also for everyone listening. So my story was, I, I was this, you know, uh, I had freelancing uh, customers in Denmark, uh, and I had the developers in Russia. Uh, I could code myself, and, and I had that. But I realized at this point in time, I never become. I'm, not, I'm never gonna become a really big company by doing this outsourcing. I'm living the life. I earn, I was I was 23, 24, and I earned 15,000 euros in profit every single month. I could live wherever I wanted. It was a good life. Not, I mean, I've never been living that good. I don't earn that much today. Haven't ever since. Lived a good life, but I wanted something big. And then I, I met my uh, like uh, my current co-founder Max uh, through a friend. Uh, that was a little bit later, 2015. Uh, I met him through a friend called Hafton. Um, got introduced and he had this new startup and the startup sounded like a cool idea, but you know, he was just another customer. He was a customer in the company. Um, this cool guy, you know, every time he came, he said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to go to this big newspaper, get a, get them to make affiliate for me. He's like, no, you're not. That's not going to happen. A week later, he came back, made a fucking contract with those guys. Every time he did something, he just fucking got back, had the thing signed. I didn't believe it. Wow. So I thought this guy, I, I need to join this guy. So uh, I decided to close my agency, uh, join him instead, uh, bought a part of the company there, I got in there, and then we started a company together called Monera. Uh, and after we, uh, I joined him, uh, we worked like half a year growing, like I, I, I built the product and, and he was out selling. What we were doing were like a FinTech startup where uh, you could go to a website, enter all your data, like how much do I earn, what's my retirement, what's my insurance, and then we made some algorithms that could you know, tell you how to improve your company. We built that, launched that, got around 500k US dollars in funding for it, uh, and grew that to 40 people over the next two years. But we went bankrupt. Uh, that is the story that led up to Liquido, which I'll come to. But that is like the the, the, the precursor to Liquido, because without that story, you, you cannot understand why I made Liquido. Yeah. about uh, I, I also read about that. Um, before we get back to, back to more about the Liquido um, growth, uh, the bankruptcy, that's really interesting. So how was the exactly. bankruptcy for you? So how was it mentally uh, to go through it, but then also to, to come back from it? And like, oh, how did it go about? So the, the thing that happened was, I mean, uh, we had a subscription product. Uh, we sold for uh, five, like 300 euros per month. And we had a very big sales force and we sold this product, signed contracts in 12 months. And in Excel, we were becoming fucking rich. You know, we sold this contract, you know, Excel models was very, very heavy. Uh, and, you know, we, we had a really good cash flow. Only problem, money didn't you know, arrive in our bank accounts. We had, you know, uh, you know, what should come in, what got into the bank account. And when you have your expenses here and you every month lose money, then one day you're just going to hit a wall. And we hit that wall and went bankrupt. Uh, and I mean, in the moment, we didn't really, really realize it, you know, because what happened is when you close a company, uh, you start to learn a lot about bankruptcies. Then suddenly you realize that, you know, um, we had some people who had like another institution that had a loan in us. And what we did, we basically restructured the company. That's a fancy word of basically saying, fuck all the old uh, people that owe the company, you, you owe money as a company. You buy the all the assets of the company, make a new company. So they they, they knew that the one that had loaned us wanted us to continue the same company in a new shell, where they bought out all the good things, which was the contracts and the software and all that IP we had. And so we never really realized we went bankrupt. We went bankrupt, but it, it felt like a restructure. We never we never had that punch in the face. The punch in the face was 
the half year after because then we you know had half a year where we had to take this this failed company all these failed angry customers and we had to try to make a company out of that and that was like a slow punch because that that half year trying to make that work that sucked not the actual hit in the face going bankrupt it was more the slow death where you sit two people doing running something you don't want to run that was the slow death that was horrible I see and that for a half a year right so basically you have the sinking ship and you're trying to get rid of the water all the time huh yeah because there was nothing really there uh so what we did we actually went to berlin um because we we lived in copenhagen uh, my co-founder he has a had, had a had, had now that was that was a wife but they, they had a girlfriend and we moved all all uh, three of us i had a friend actually also so we were four of us uh, moving to berlin and just to you know get away from everything uh away from family away from friends just to you know get some some new air uh and we were coming to a uh, co-working space every single day working a little bit on this failed startup but getting new ideas we wanted to move on do something new and then after half a year we realized we want to build the credo which we'll get back to in a moment and then we say we said well, now you're going to build this new thing we're going to take two months off where we're going to do nothing so we went to asia traveling around just vacationing and then we got back in march 18 with full energy for the new startup which was the credo all right cool and then you you were the cto responsible for building up the whole it infrastructure and the software and everything i mean the way it starts is that you have an idea uh and we had we in, in the credo we realized that we were really good at selling but we were really fucking bad at everything about managing our customers all this debt management sending invoices doing accounting we were really bad at this like horrifically bad and every founder is this we, you, you, any entrepreneur who's good at building companies will suck at this part right that is like a rule if you if you're good at building companies you, you suck at accounting <laughs> that's like a, a like a, a rule in life right uh so we just wanted to build a company to to to, to basically solve that problem so we started with digital debt collection for later we changed it so we we said we want to build a debt collection company basically do debt collection smarter and in the start you don't give a shit about titles i mean i took my laptop i can code and i started coding i started building the product i started you know doing all the lines i know she's sharp i know .net i know uh, some racer i i don't know javascript it's embarrassing i don't do but i just built it i built that you know in an old technology i used jquery and built all that stuff the first few months and max just took the phone he started calling the government how do i get licensed he started calling certain customers hey we are a debt collection agency he just called he made linkedin he wrote a book about debt collection to really understand all the logics about it and made the first like really book about debt collection you know for for smaller companies so we just started when and and then you know uh that's how you can start you can go with fuck titles or you, you just start all right yeah i mean of course the title now uh just seems grandiose and titles are especially something in big corporations right <laughs> and small companies say most of the time they don't matter too much uh it's uh, yeah but the that's interesting so basically um the failed enterprise that you, well the failed um startup that you had before yeah, exactly. basically led to the product that you built after liquido right exactly uh, wow. and funny enough many of this uh, many 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 of we, we got to 40 employees in the old company and actually multiple people from the old company joined the new one because they really really you know like working with us uh, especially with some of the developers and the new company you know we didn't have any money starting out but we made a very very big decision in the new one and the last company we took i, I lost like around a, a little bit less than 100k dollars in the last company which is a lot of money uh and especially for my co-founder who didn't have he, he didn't have any money from before he was just, he's, he's younger than me so he didn't have the money he got the money from his parents it's a lot of money to lose in a company mm. i mean a lot of money don't get me wrong he, he was 23 24 it's a lot of money to lose 100k dollars and he lost more than i did because i you know i had a smaller ownership stake so i i, I invested less uh, uh, during it in the new one we wanted you know he didn't have any money i didn't have any money left uh we wanted to uh get a salary from day number one because you know i wanted to live somewhere he wanted to live somewhere so we decided to get investments uh basically from day, from day number one i think we got investments after after three months uh so there we got 100k dollars for eight percent of the company and that is like when we started having our first employees we hired like a supporter very broad person 
uh, we hired our, our first developer and we started having, you know, a little bit initial, uh, you know, people going around there. But that's a lot of faith from the investor giving you with the super young company eight, uh, well, an evaluation of uh, a million almost. Yeah, but then again, Or even more. you come yeah. with these two young guys who has previously scaled a company to 40 people. They have proven they can build the product. We had proven we could get at like around $5,000 in revenue uh, a month uh, after it basically on nothing. And we we were we are, we are crazy, meaning that we, we we sell them on the fact we want to become one of the biggest companies in Europe, whatever we're doing always or in the in the world. And if you are, there's not that many good founders in the world. That is like a big problem. There's not enough good founders who can really work. And we we are fitting many of the boxes you know investors are looking for, you know, hardworking, you know, who both can sell but also build. Having the the the, the, the commercial founder, the technical founder. And also someone who can get really far by themselves and who is relentless and are not patient. I mean, we are Im impatient. I can, I mean, if, if you're not live within a month, I would be ripping my hair off. And and that is like one of the things investors also want to see. I, re I see. Okay. So it was really, really easy getting the money. I mean, it's never easy, but it took us literally three weeks to get that money. That's amazing. And that was in Berlin? No, we, we moved home to Copenhagen. Uh, there. So that was from Denmark. Uh, I would probably like to stay in Berlin to, to start there because it would have been better for the company. But, you know, and also my co-founder are German, but, uh, you know, you have your family and friends at home. So, so you know, they they, they, they wanted to go home uh, there. I see. All right. So, well, yeah, there's no place like home, especially if it's a cool place like Copenhagen. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think that is a little bit more my co-founder than me, maybe. Uh, I am a little bit more adventurous. I'm also the guy traveling, and I, right now I'm basically nomading around normally. Uh, so that is a little bit more me. Uh, but in the end, it has to work for both of you. And I think a big change we make, in the last company, we worked a lot. We worked 70, 80 hours per week. And when most people say that, people, oh, it sounds cool, you work a lot. But if you try to take 80 hours, which we did some weeks, and you, and you try to divide that by seven, That's a lot of hours. And then you also want to have one day off. Then you're getting a rough 13 hours per day. Try to put 13 hours of work into a normal day. That is that is a lot of hours. You, you wake up at 9, you stop at 10 p.m. Yeah. That is, I mean, when people say it, they say it to sound cool, but we did we did the 70, 80 hours. Hmm. And it, I mean, that is extremely unhealthy. I mean, yep. it is not good to do that. And we made the keto, we made the commitment that we will work closer to 50 to 60 hours. Mm -hmm. And we would have a company where we can always be remote. Max doesn't don't, don't want to use it, but it's essential for me. So we made some you know promises to ourselves when we started a new company there. All right. So basically, learn from yourself as person or as people. Like, what do you need, and what is exactly. you know, your character and your personality? What are core aspects of life that you just need to be fulfilled in order to become successful? Yeah, I totally understand that, and I think uh, working. Even 50 to 60 hours, I think, is, is not healthy uh, long term. It's, it depends, of course, on, on how, uh, how you perceive the work, how stressful the work is, because there are people who are stressed more about work and there are people who are stressed less about work, right? So it really depends on how you feel about the work. But um, yeah, there is, there is this, this saying, I can't replicate it perfectly, but it's like, um, if you can't find, rest, uh, find, can't find time for leisure, then you... Basically, you you will die or something. Well, I can't properly say it, but you will. Ha you <laughs> no, have to. Know. You have to find the leisure. It's it's come, It's it's a uh, in Civilization Six, this video game. There is this statement when you build a, a monument. <laughs> <Nice. you know? laughs> so that's where I had I heard this. <laughs> All right. But I think it's extremely important to note that when you build a company that is funded funded by venture capitalists, which we have got that funding later, that is not healthy. Mm -hmm. It is not healthy for you. It is not healthy for the company. You're basically trying to pour gasoline over a fire, mm -hmm. and that is not healthy for anyone involved in that. So I think it is really important to say that if you want to build a company and have a good life, then you should do that. But then you should not take investor investment money for people where you tell them you're going to do a venture capitalist case. Mm -hmm. We are open. We want to be a unicorn. We want to become worth a billion dollars. We want to become one of the biggest companies. But if you say that, you also say yes to lots of unhealthy things, and you have to be very much aware of that. You cannot yeah. say you want to, you know, you know, enjoy life and do that at the same time. Yeah, of course, it's a price you pay. That's uh, it is what it is, right? Exactly. All right, great. Um, so, how do you then? Uh, 
reduce the pressure or like um, how do you spend your your leisure time then so i'm a, i'm a person that is i i don't believe in balance anything in life i do either or uh, so if i drink soda i don't drink one i drink eight uh, i don't do things very well uh, in uh, you know in a small amount so i work uh, all the time uh, and then i don't work when i don't work uh, for instance, this this weekend I I had a trip. I went uh, to Netherlands. Um, I didn't work at all. Didn't think about work. Uh, today, I'm, I'm, after this talk here, I'm probably gonna work until eleven or midnight, and then so I'm gonna do the same again tomorrow. So I think for me, I'm just make sure that I have other things in my life, but I'm not very good at balancing it. So I'm not gonna work, you know, nine to six, and and then you know maybe I mean I'm I'm gonna do either or, and that's how I do it. So I find things I enjoy the most. Which is, of course, you know, uh, traveling. It is friends. It is exercise. All those things. I'm gonna fill that in, but but in in very extreme ways. All right, interesting. Definitely a different approach than most people do. For them, it's trying to yeah, balance and, and life. I, I, don't, I, I don't. It is not healthy to do it. And I think if I mean, I'm also interested in saying I'm not, I don't have kids, right? Because if if you have a family and you have kids, then you live a different lifestyle. Uh, I'll probably have kids one day, and then I'll have to you know change some of the things that I'm doing right now. That's fine, but uh, I mean, right now I'm not having to worry about that. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. As, as a man, don't don't rush it, man. <laughs> I have two no, children, exactly. <laughs> so like, uh, I can uh, I can recommend to not rush it, definitely. Um, so, uh, how did you? So you already told a little bit the background story, but how would you say would you recommend someone to come up with a business idea? I would say. There's this saying, when you are very young, uh, you know, start 20s, then you try to build very big consumer apps. You, you try to build this, you know, very ambitious projects that is like, you know, being creative. And that's because you haven't seen the real world yet. You're, you're naive. You're, you're doing something new. And what you, the risk there is what you call a market risk. That is, you know, the risk is you build some new shiny app and no one uses it because it's a fucking bad idea because you have no idea how the world works. But if you hit the good idea, then you're going to build the next Facebook or the next Snapchat. That is why all the founders of these huge companies are young, 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 young. The founders of Google, Facebook, Snapchat, they're all young people. That's because they are building something crazy new. When you get 30 years old, then you've seen the world. You have seen, you know, where the money are. You know there's problem businesses. So you build... You know, you, you build products you know is going to be valuable. You know, you, you don't take the risk of building a new Snapchat because fuck that. You, you, the chances are too high if not working. When I build companies, there's execution risk. I will build the biggest debt collection company. Are, there, are, there, are, there, are people buying debt collection? I guarantee they are. So if I fail my startup, it's because I executed that. That's because I hired the wrong people. Or I built, you know, the wrong things. I, I can't code. That's a different risk. So I think it depends. If you want to become the next you know, Mark Zuckerberg, then you should just, you know, try to build your unicorn idea, you know, uh, trying to make it work. But do know there's like one in a million chance it's going to work. What mm -hmm. I would recommend anyone doing, anyone who wants to stay in life, is to build startups that have execution risk. That means get out in the real world. Get a job. Get a job and see how things are. Try to, you know, uh, do things. Get hobbies. Uh, try to uh, get really deep in the industry. I think in, in industries that you find the most interesting B2B problems that is super niche with low competition where you can make a huge impact. So my idea is find startups that require execution risk instead of market risk because market risks are hugely, hugely risk for your time. Yeah. Yeah, I was always having a bunch of ideas. I was the, the guy with the ideas on always and, and sharing it with people and many of them were garbage, but some of them were good. And then I was constantly jumping back and forth between different kind of uh, ideas and n never finishing anything, right? Never really doing something proper. And then I started with the courses and the tutorials and just felt right. And I just stuck with it, you know, and that's, that really helped me. So I'm not, not looking plus, at other stuff it, all the time, you know, like, because it really like, then you lose focus, right? I think, and what you're doing right is that you focus on courses. Are people going to, are people buying courses? Yeah, they are. So if you're building better courses than other people, people are going to buy your courses. And if yeah. you focus on that one thing and you become insanely good, people are going to buy it. And I think, but if you decided to make something new, which is like, you know, courses on TikTok, I don't know, if, I don't, probably a very bad idea. <laughs> but then there's like, uh, then there's a market risk, but you're doing something, you know, people are going to want. And that's really good if you want to become, 
you know, if you want to become an entrepreneurial with a high certainty. Yeah. So basically find something that you really like, where, is, where there is a market already, become really good at it and then make a business out of it. And, and then honestly, I think this is something that, you know, people say, oh, jump out, follow your idea. I disagree. Uh, my take is go out, find the hottest local startup in your area and get a job there. Because going into the real world, going into get some get some industry you know knowledge, learn how other people are scaling their companies. Don't join a corporate company because you're not going to learn anything. You're going to sit in the corner and do boring code. Don't don't do that. Please don't. Find a scale up because scale ups has this awesome feature. A scale up are like startups that is like having like probably like fifty hundred plus employees that is growing very fast and that they have to grow two to three x per year. Those companies are burning. Being in those companies are horrible because nothing works. There is fires everywhere and there is things that can be optimized everywhere. But it also means you get the opportunity to learn. Go there, uh, work crazy amount and then learn that industry they are in because then you're gonna see a billion business ideas. But get that job where you learn from real, in other, like where you learn how the real work, world works because you're not gonna find the next, I mean, all the obvious ideas, like, people are getting obvious ideas look, oh, Oh, I want this app that can track when I'm running. Yeah, no, that already invented, dude. But if you go to this very niche, you know, uh, company that is building, you know, construction, some kind of weird construction sites, and you can find some weird, you know, small niche idea there, that is where you're going to make the, the cool ideas with very low risk because no one, because it requires something special to go there. Don't do all the obvious things. All right. All right. I see. Yes. This That's working. my take. Working for startups. Well, I worked for a corporation for two years and uh, I realized that it, uh, it can be boring. It can be very boring, definitely. Um, so I also see, by the way, that you're wearing an aura ring on your finger. So yes. uh, I also have one at home. I'm not wearing it today. So uh, about health. So basically this ring helps you to track your sleep, right? For some, for people don't know, that don't know, this ring is basically a better... Uh, sleep tracker than your watch can do and um, it tracks your, your temperature and all of the good stuff so it really makes sure that uh, it indicates how good your sleep was and then gives you a couple of hints on how to get better sleep and what you should take care of so how do you exactly. like with this stressful life and this hard work how do you get enough sleep and really like force yourself to get the well i don't know hopefully seven to eight hours a night um or what do you, what else do you do for your health in order to stay fit? Because in 31, that's when you start realizing that it's it's not you're, you're not going to be able to work 70 to 80 hours for the rest of your life, right? <laughs> so I think I want to live the longest possible uh, because I believe that in the future we're gonna have much much long much more much longer health spans, and I want to optimize my chance of being part of that. Uh, and that means if I'm going to die at 60, there I have much less chance than if I die naturally uh, at 95, because then I believe there's a good chance that I can maybe live to 105, that means I can live to 110 and, and so forth. So back to, the, to, to your question. I think everyone in, everything in, li in life starts with a goal. And my goal is to live as long as possible. Now, I'm, not, I'm breaking my own rule. You see a cola here. Yeah. That is breaking my own rule. I'm, I'm addicted to this stuff here. It's not good. But... I try to, in many areas of my life as possible, to really care about my health. I will get eight hours of sleep every day as possible. And that is more important than seeing friends. It's more important than going to work. I will, that is the most important because uh, in the end, that is like probably like really, 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 really important to me. I run exercise five times a week. Before this call, I was out running five kilometers. Nice. Not a long one, but getting it very, very often. So I think for me, health are really important, but not because, I mean, of course I believe I can, I have, when I have more energy, I will do better work, all those things, of course, but I also, because I have a longer goal in mind. Yeah. Yeah. For me, this, this idea so, of living forever is also like, at least for a very long time, forever is, a, is a in, incomprehensible for us, but for a very long time, I really liked the idea uh, of doing that. But the best is if you have a healthy uh, rest of your life so to speak and therefore you need to stay healthy and uh, sleep is the number one thing you can do for your health yeah it definitely is and the number two is of Sleeping, course uh, food and nutrition eating. and moving 
Yeah, I, I think generally, I mean, I'm not a very good, you know, there person, but I mean, also the body weight is important. I think it's really important that you uh, get to a pretty low BMI. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, calorie restriction would be the best thing possible. But there's some things you can do there. Yeah. But in the end, I think people are making a mistake when, because in the end, uh, if you're building a company or learning to code or anything else in life, that is, you know, it's not about sprinting. It's about the marathon. It's about the long run. And I think people who don't have time to run or meditate, they are retarded. Because in the end, that is because they're saying, look, I prefer getting this thing done, uh, you know, right now instead of ignoring the health. But that is going to cost you because that means, you know, you're going to live shorter. You're going to have less energy. You're going to make stupid decisions. And that's going to make you stupid. I think in the end, if you exercise every single day and live very healthy, you're going to live longer. And that living longer will always be better in the long term anyway. Uh, and if you want to earn money, you do not interest is the number one thing. Compounding over time is longer. So living five, ten years longer, being healthy, will also economically be the best thing you can ever do. Meaning that I think it is, I think people who don't exercise are stupid. That's my take. All right. But what do you consider exercise? I mean, for you, it's jogging, right? But it could also be just walking, right? A, a long walk. And if anything that gets you out, that gets the pulse up, and you get the energy. Running, uh, it could be hiking, it could be biking, it could be you know playing soccer, it could be playing golf. Anything that gets you out there, not sitting on your ass the whole day. I think that is really important. And I do respect. Not everyone has like if you live in uh, India. I mean, there are some areas where it's difficult to go out and run. It's not built there, but you can still then go out and get some exercise moving around, or even in your apartment, you can do exercise there. You know, it's it's so, so important, and I think. It's really fun to see the life expectancy in countries like China and Singapore there. It is much higher than here because they have an in-ground culture with two things. They are, one, not you know over-consuming anyway. You will never see a Chinese person go in and eat a ton of candy. They have self-control because it's in the culture. And they have a culture of you know daily exercise. And that means you live a much more healthy life uh, by doing that. And I think that's something we can all learn from. All right. Yeah, I definitely agree. Health is super important. It's uh, also the, the interesting thing is that by doing breaks, that's when you are progressing. And uh, I had to, I have also this interesting side story where I was uh, coding for my bachelor thesis. I was coding a, a software. It was a game back then, a very simple game. And I was stuck at something at the point, and I just couldn't fix it. I was sitting there for hours and hours. It's like. I don't know, like eight hours, couldn't fix that problem. And then I went out, had a couple of drinks, and then I, I went to bed. <laughs> I went to bed at four o'clock at night. I, I woke up and I was like, I got it now. And then I sat down, I was working for 10 hours and I, and I fixed it and I, and I produced so much value in these in this 10 hours as I would usually do in a week. So that's what, yep. what happens when you free up your, your brain and you just allow yourself to have a quick break and really just get get uh, away from whatever the challenge is that you're currently facing yeah back to you being stupid if you don't exercise because if you don't have that mental break you're gonna be stupid because you make they're gonna make bad decisions yeah yeah and decisions in the end they make your success right like they they decide exactly. whether you're gonna be successful or not and healthy or not <laughs> and i think tie back to my old company monero one of the reasons we went bankrupt because we were stupid I mean, because we worked so much and we didn't take the breaks, we, we, stood, we, we were stupid. We made stupid decisions all the time. And when you, if you work a lot and you get so tired that the job the next day, you're tired in the morning. Are you going to take the, the frog, like the ugliest, evil, most difficult task in the morning? No, you're not. You're going to take a cup of coffee and reply to the easy, the easy emails. But if you have you know, slept eight hours and you have just been like biking 30 kilometers in the morning, You're, you're ready to take that very annoying you know, task you have to do or that very annoying phone call that you have to do. And that's just so important in the end. So that's why I really believe you have to, to take care of your health. Otherwise, you're going to be making the mistakes. All right. So um, let's get back to programming a little because that's where my, yes. my audience mainly resides in. So um, how would you recommend someone who is an aspiring developer who has no experience whatsoever to get a job, potentially in your company even? Like, what would you uh, tell them to do if they, let's say, ha have half a year or maybe a year max in order to be ready to attack or tackle a job? Maybe in your company after a year, I don't know if you, uh, if you hire um, juniors, but like generally, what would you recommend? So I think... It is really important that many junior people also want to be digital nomads and have a remote job. 
And I think something that is extremely, I don't believe in, I don't believe juniors uh, should be remote. And I believe when you are a senior with experience and you know the craft, then you can be remote. So I think if you are a junior developer and you're out there, I think the following is very important. It's very important you find a company physically close to you where they are actually uh, having a mentor. You should never work at a company where you're the only developer because then you have to don't have the mentor. Find preferably a startup. That is my, my bias. It can also be a, 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 a corporate. That's just my personal bias. You got to have more fun in a startup, but you can do the corporate if you want. Uh, and then you're going to have a mentor there and you're going to learn and you're going to learn in the real environment. And I think that is so. So look local and, 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 and then go there. And then it's a matter of standing out. You have no idea how boring the average application is. Average application, that is basically someone sending a CV and maybe a very boring letter. You don't stand out. Now, how do you stand up? Uh, stand out. Well, what most do is they will send me 14 messages, they will find my number and call me, and they will send emails. That is a perfect way to get blocked, and I will never talk to you again because you're crazy. Now, what you have to do is to stand up in some crazy way. What I, what I have never tried anyone, uh, you know, hey, I used your API, uh, and this was the feedback when I called your API. I think you should improve this. I have never received that. I have never uh, received anyone saying, hey, I tried your product. These are three improvements you could make. Uh, I have never made, we have some public repos, never made anyone, I, hey, I made this pull request, uh, can I see that? Or I've never tried, hey, can I, by the way, try to come to your company and work in, like, at this project 50 hours for free? I really want to stand out. If, and, and it's really important to understand here, if you're young and you want to get started in your career and you really want the best jobs, you want to find someone who's growing fast. If that's being corporate, that's fine. If it's a scale-up, that's fine. And then stand out. Do the, do the extra mile. Because no one does it. I have never never had anyone do any of these things. And it, it will take you five hours. And yes, yeah. that's a risk you want to take. But that is where you stand up. Don't spam people. Don't call, start calling them. Don't send like four messages into WhatsApp. You're going to be blocked. But doing the thing that makes you stand out. Even send a Loom video. You have this tool called Loom where you can make weird videos for free. Where you can say, hey, my name is. And you can explain who you are. Only try that one person ever did that. One person out of probably like 10,000 applicants in total. Wow. People okay. suck at applying jobs. Stand out. All right. Yeah, I also noticed that searching for people that they they don't even like adjust their messaging and their persona or whatever their well to do your job application right. So they don't care about what you're doing actually. They just want to get a job. And once they have a job, their their goal is achieved, right? But you want them to have a proper task. Like they they need to want to create. In my case, tutorials, right? They do teach people to actually move forward in in their skills and in their career. And um, yeah, that's. Very few people do that. Man, we get 20, 30 applications uh, before we get one that we even want to read, right? It's it's really bad. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that that's a very important distinction here, by the way. That's really important to say. When it's one of your first jobs, then it's different. Because then you have to stand up. You have to do all the things you're saying. Now, if you're eight years in and you are a senior, then you don't have to ha don't ever have to look at a job again. I, everyone in my company is getting at least two to three messages a week on LinkedIn. Basically, people trying to recruit them. Now, I've never lost an employee. I've lost one. Uh, that's not true. Um, that, but that, that happens when you're a senior and you work in a good company. But for your first job, start local, stand out. Seriously, try to, every company has a public API, make an application, make a Loom video where it shows what you've done and get the job and even say, look, I'm going to ready to go half salary the first half year because that you're going to earn that back 10 times because you're special in standing out. I love that. Yeah, but it's... Uh... So, for example, if you see they have a really poor website, make them a better website. I mean, this is a little, a, a lot of effort. But let's say this is the company that you're super hyped about working and you really want to work for them. That's really an option. Maybe not the, the entire website, but maybe just the, the home page, you know, like just make the home page look better. And then you're golden. They will see, oh, wow, this guy uh, or this girl, she knows what they're, uh, she's doing. And exactly. she's motivated. She actually sees what we do and understands what we do because that's something that you can show in the website that you're building, right? So there are so many things that you can basically read from somebody's work and that's, yeah, that's something you can do there. All right, nice. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, did you ever uh, learn something from, digi uh, from online courses, like video courses, like the ones that I do, for example? Like not mine, yeah, mine specifically, uh... but in general. Yeah, tons, tons. Uh, so what, what I mean, 
I, when I was like, you know, uh, studying in university, there was not any online degrees really. There was really nothing there. But since then, I have learned a ton of things online. I think I, I've la- learned a lot of JavaScript, even though know, I suck at it. I have learned Python. I have learned quite a lot of, you know, machine learning stuff. I have been learning Vue.js. I mean, uh, I, I do at least a few Udemy's per year. Uh, and, and I think I learned a lot from that. I think it's a great way to learn. I think fundamentally starting from zero and learning, that's an option. Uh, and that is, uh, like, it's really good to do that. Of course, you have to combine it with real experience. But I think especially for, like, learning a specific technology or learning something, building a top, that's really amazing. Uh, really, really, really cool thing there on top. All right. Good to hear. Yeah, that's, that's why I do my work because of that because of exactly that like really helping out people that need to get a specific skill right and then there are a bunch of uh, other people doing the, the same thing but then in the end it's the, the quality that you produce as well as the likability that you have and stuff right so this this is why even if there is a bunch of competition already doesn't mean that there is no room for you and no room for your own work like uh, anyone who watches who watches this <laughs> it- it's a, it's a back to the execution risk. If you just do it better than everyone else, then you're going to work out. Yeah. And do you, uh, what do you think about the future of online education? I think that many people look at the current situation with, you know, the current edu- and, and, uh, education online and, and think we are quite far. I think online education is one of those things where we haven't started yet. I think we are in the, in the 1%. I think if you look back and send 15 years of online education, it's going to be completely different. Uh, I think there is going to be completely changed how online education works. There are so many interesting startups right now in the space entering. I personally, I really love the model of something like Lambda School or these like uh, where, where if they basically works is that they will, you know, you'll get an education for free, but then they will uh, take part of your salary for a few years. Now, there is a ton of these startups in different industries. I don't know if Lambda is good, especially there's like got a good, good or bad sides on them and a lot of critiques also. But I think there's just like one trend is happening. Of course, something like Udemy uh, and these platforms for courses is going to also develop. But but I think having the human element to it and having teachers, I, I think the whole education system is going to change. And I think also the fact that we today have a society where you you learn and then you work, that that's going to be broken more into like you learn, you work, you learn, you work. I think the whole society is going to change around how you you perceive education. And I think that's going to be funded by startups like Lambda School, where you're going to get paid you know, you said education for free, and then you can afterwards, um, you know, uh, you know, pay a part of your salary. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I read about this like seven years or eight years ago, and I was, I was amazed. Like that's such a cool concept, right? And there were people yeah. getting educated. It's a three-month degree, for example, at this one other company. I don't know what it, it wasn't Lambda. Probably it was a different one. And then. Uh, you most of the developers would get like 80 90k a year and they would just take a uh, yeah. 10% to 15% of that as a remuneration for two years or whatever so it's a it's an amazing concept i exactly. really love it yeah all right so um you you said about the application process when it comes to what you're looking for and how people can stand out but what is it that you are looking at specifically in developers when you are hiring them So we are looking for um, probably like three things. I mean, we of course look for technical skills. And because we are a remote first organization, we only hire seniors uh, because I don't, juniors require local things. And that's, that's my take. And that means we look for someone who is deeply technical. And, and our technical interview is not fun. It is it's the one and a half hour we are going to get grilled on a whiteboard or like online whiteboard. It's not easy. Uh, very few passes this. Uh, it's very, very, very brutal. Um, and that's because we need deep technical skill. And also that people have to deliver an actual application uh, that doesn't take long to write, but we, it has to be good code. Then we look for people who are uh, really good at conversation, business talking. We, 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 in Likido, we use something called uh, empower product teams. What that means is that developers, we don't have testers. If you if you not if you're not a grown up to test your own code, then you shouldn't be in my team. You should fuck off. Uh, we believe people have to be grown ups and be really smart and understand business decisions. If you I mean, we will give you all the opportunities to understand the business and also get close to con to con- and talk to customers and basically understand the business problems. We don't give you all the answers. You have to be able to be part of the solution yourself. You you, you should have be able to get a really broad problem and solve it. 
that's what I expect from my senior developers. And then in the end, uh, the, the third thing I'm looking for is that when I'm looking to a person and I ask myself, if I'm, if I'm going to be stuck in a week with, on an island with that person, would I have fun or would I have a bad time? If I'm not replying, I'm going to have fun, I'm not going to hire that person. All right, I like that. I like that. <laughs> and I think... And I think what we're doing is we are paying substantially more than the average. I think our average salary, they're starting from the 3,000 euros on the lowest and going up to seven, 8,000 for the highest. That's a lot for a remote team uh, per month. And I think we can do that because we have extremely high expectations and we hire people who have a lot of experience. I know there's probably many of you out here learning code that you don't have that experience. But I think this is, you know, uh, because we are remote first team, which is why I recommend starting with a local team. And then when you have the experience, you can gradually go over to this remote team model where you, you can have these kind of high salaries and very like, you know, it's really, really, really uh, fun to work with. Nice. All right. That's great. Yeah, I definitely like this uh, being on an island for a week with someone, <laughs> if you would enjoy that time or not. That's really something that uh, it's it's a gut feeling that I always uh, was trying to follow, but basically that's that's it, right? Like if you feel the person or if you don't feel the person, right? And then how about I mean, the team uh, chemistry? Because you that's also a point, right? Because you uh, you have a team of people. So are you just um, so are, are you taking their decisions or their opinions into the decision as well? Like when hiring someone. Yeah, so, so, so during a, a, a hiring process, we, uh, at least four different people from different roles will meet the person. And if one person says no, then it's a no. Wow. All right. That's a tough process. Um, huh? It's a tough process. And that also means like out of three, four applicants, we hire maybe one. And that is worse odds than getting an investment from a VC. Uh, this is very bad odds. And Liquid is not easy to be hired at. Also because we are, I mean, we are a remote first company. We have high salaries. We have quite a lot of vacation. We have fun work, like working structure. We use new technologies. We have a really good boss, and it's making sure you have personal development. We have all the perks because we want the best developers. But that also means getting in there is difficult, and that is something that I have learned. I mean, my first startup, we, we didn't have those requirements. We took everyone in, basically. Mm. Um, but now I have become extremely critical in, in the hiring process because I want the best, and, and we can't. And also, we pay for the best, uh, which is because we have a situation where we got the funding, which is lucky. All right, cool, and. Um, what would you say are the struggles of a remote team? Because you say that you only want to work remotely. Of course, there are a bunch of advantages, but what are the biggest challenges? I think there's a few that is standing out for me uh, the most. I think the biggest one being that if you are a junior programmer uh, and you have some experience, you know how often the console just says, fuck you, I'm an error. And then you Google, fuck you, I'm an error, and you're not going to get the problem solved. If you sit next to a senior, then you say, hey, Peter, uh, can you look at this? And then he says, oh, no, no, no. and then it's fixed, right? Because Peter, he's a fucking genius and he sits next to you. Yeah. That is why I don't want juniors because, they, you know, you need that environment. The amount of times I've abused Peter and all the other guys is crazy because I was a very slow learner. Um, I was, that, that, I needed that. And I, and I believe people need that when you're starting out in your career. That gets less over time because you learn when the console says, F you, you what you should do. Mm -hmm. I think that's one thing. Then, of course, communication, because everyone says that. That is true. It is, it is easy to take five people into a, a, a room, draw on the whiteboard, talk about how things connect than you do in a remote call. That will always be easier physically. Um, and then I think also that it, we believe it's really important that we have a team of missionaries and not mercenaries. We need someone who really wants to work, work for Liquido. And that's quite easy if you're a local because then, you know, you, you, you drink every Friday together. If you have Friday bar, not every Friday mm -hmm. because people have families. And, you know, but you have, a more, you, know, you, you have a more social ties. If you're online, it can become quite transactional and you don't really become friends. So you need to invest a lot to, to not just the whole thing being transactional. You need to send a lot of memes. And now, I mean, memes are not going to solve everything, uh, but you, you need to meet physically also. I mean, we, we, before COVID, we met at least two times a week. That was the, that, that, that's like the rule we have. You have to do a lot of things more to force that thing to happen. Okay. All right. Interesting. Yeah, that's also helping me out because I I have a remote team, right? So <laughs> I'm also hiring it, it is more people but, now. So. Yeah. yeah. After I read your blog, I was super, um, like, I, I do some of the things that you do already as well. So it, uh, some more tips that really helped me. Especially the thing is, like, sometimes you just read something and you feel like, oh, that's a really cool thing. But then you reflect and you basically do it in a similar fashion already, but maybe not to that degree. Yeah. And then like just 
trying that degree or upping the degree uh, can sometimes do the trick, right? Okay, so um, how often do you find it hard to keep up with the business requirements when they are a bit unrealistic due to the technical lim limitations? Well, that's a long question. Uh, no, but uh, uh, it totally makes sense. I think here it helps a lot being a co-founder. Uh, and it helps a lot picking a really good co-founder. Um, so our, our team, Max, my co-founder, he is an extreme realist. Uh, and he's extremely... We have never been in disagreement because then we sit down, we talk about the facts, and then often either of us is wrong, and then we, we agree. It's very often we disagree there. So I think back to the original question. We, if you work in a company that is sales-led, meaning that the sales organization is controlling the company, then you end up in that problem because then this, you, the, the sales have promised the customers, hey, we're going to have this feature by this then, and they make a roadmap the next 12 months. And, you know, then you're basically a slave to the sales team. And that is what majority of all companies are. If you are, join any big company, that's how it is. I mean, that's, that's how all companies basically function. The Quido and like many other of these scale ups and also the big like Uber, Google, Airbnb, whatever, they are what you call product led. And there the whole business is turned around. Here the product is the one that is leading the company. And there's a very big difference here because here, uh, you know, the business requirements is a little bit coming around to the product. So we find out we want to go this direction with the product and then everything else falls around the product, if that makes sense. So we don't have those requirements in the same sense. Of course, we have we need have we have revenue targets, we have everything else, but then you know we, we try to build around that by you know the product is leading the direction. If that makes any sense. All right, cool. That's, I know, uh... and then the most concrete answer. But I think there's a, when, 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 yeah, it's just, sorry. <laughs> no, that's cool. It's just uh, I I'm. I think that this is a very specific question that will probably not be very relevant for most of the guys that we have, uh, ex ex except for like they get a task for, from their boss that is rather unrealistic to achieve. And then they still struggle or they try, but they struggle. So how would you, but, but would I, you recommend to push I, I, back I, potentially if somebody, if your boss comes with a t a totally unrealistic requirements or expectations? Like if somebody comes to answers. you, how how would that person have to manage you in order for you to be, all right, maybe I should adjust my expectations there or something like that? I, I have two answers. The first answer is if you work in a company that is happening, you're working in a toxic company. Because if you just get a task from a manager and he doesn't, and you, you're not the one defining the problem and solution together, then you work in a toxic company that is basically giving you a feature to build and you're working in a feature factory which is going back to this whole sales lab problem I talked about before. So that is the first part of the answer. You can't use anything because you have the job and you enjoy working there. And if you can't use that answer for anything. So sorry for just bringing it up. Um, so get a new job. Uh, the second answer uh, is basically, of course, communication. Uh, you have to basically be really saying, hey, uh, you, you give me this amount of time. I, I believe this can be done. What you're saying is unrealistic. But, I, but, but what I propose is we do this instead that will solve this amount of the problem. Now, that requires you to understand the business because if, you, if you're just working in, uh, in the vacuum and you don't know what they're trying to achieve with the feature, you cannot do that. What if you do this instead? And that's why I'm, if you're not working in a company where you're, where you're part of the business decision and part of scoping that, you're working in a very bad place because then you can't do the real job of the developer, which is also defining the solutions. That is my take. Um, not a very useful answer, uh, but uh, that is my honest opinion about it. The thing is, I I totally understand it after I read a bunch of, of uh, books around that topic and stuff, you know, like there are even these recommendations where they say every single employee should have at least uh, like one week a year or whatever, where they are in customer support, not specifically customer support, but yes, at least yes, like yes. super close to the customer in order to understand what is it that you are even making like why why is what is this feature going to do for your customers and why are you even building this thing right yeah because in the end when you push back to your boss you cannot say this is not realistic you're giving me too little time he doesn't give a shit yeah. he just wants to get his pop because his boss is also telling him you're too slow but what you need to do is you need to come back with an alternative 
yeah. where we can do this instead with this kind of, and this is a smaller thing, but it solves this, this problem. But your idea sucks if you, if you don't understand the business because you need to understand the business and why you're building it in the first place to make that what if. And that is why I, that's important you understand that. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you very much. So then um, let's go. Well, I have a one about your high energy, which you almost answered entirely already, but there is a sub question. So uh, I wanted to ask you, how can you keep up your energy? But you said you do a lot of exercise and you sleep well, right? And then um, what other routines do you, or what do you recommend or do you follow which you would recommend? I think the obvious is, of course, sleep, going to bed and wake up at the same time every day. Uh, I take a ton of supplements. Uh, I say do exercise a lot. Uh, I would say when you work, you work. And when you don't work, don't work. Uh, meaning that you should really, I mean, when I am out, you know, uh, you know, eating, eating with friends, I don't give a, I don't think about work. You should learn to shut your brain off. And I think the way you do that is by meditating and you learn how to do that. I think every successful person should be really says they're meditating. No surprise. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, as also, if you can't fall asleep, you, you just meditate and you'll fall asleep. Yeah. I think that is the, the main ones. Of course, then, of course, you have to learn new things. If you're not reading at least, you know, 10, 20 books a year, I would be worried. Uh, I think you don't spend enough time reading. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to do that. And it, it can also just be, you know, listening to podcasts. Don't listen to true crime or something else that is fun because you're not going to learn from that. Stop watching Netflix. Stop listening to true crime. Stop listening to fun stuff. Music is awesome sometimes, but listen to real books. Listen to deep podcasts about topics you, you, you're passionate about. You know, if you watch Netflix, then at least go for documentary, please. Don't watch, you know, Mean Girls, what it's called, uh, and, and, and be ambitious in life. I think that is because if you have big goals, that it die by itself gives you energy. Nice. Yeah, big goals, definitely. I... Uh... I have this, like when I am super motivated by my big goals, then I wake up with this high energy already, like high expectations. Exactly. So, oh yeah, today I'm going to do this, this and that. And so that's, uh, that's a really big one. Yeah. Okay. So um, then a couple of questions that will go towards the cryptocurrencies direction. So yes, uh, I know that you're very interested in cryptocurrency. And I'm going to give you just a little bit of my backstory and then you can jump in with yours. And uh, we, we, uh, I even have some specific questions there. Oh, your camera uh, went off. Now you're back. Okay. All right. Um, so my little backstory, it was 2013 and I, uh, the, the Bitcoin went up to a thousand dollars for the first time. And I was like, woo, it was end of December, 2013. And uh, what I then did is I bought a mining rig. Actually, I bought a bunch of hardware that I built together and bought nice. the, I built the mining rig with six <laughs> graphics cards and a fan oh, that was exterior. And I took a, a, like, um, like, like something like this, right, that I had around. I don't know the, the, uh, the English term for it, whatever. And I put the graphics cards next to each other and they were hanging because it was too close oh, on the motherboard, right? It would be too close together. So with that thing, 1600 watt, living in Malaga, um, I was mining bitcoins and I mined a bitcoin a month and uh, electricity bills were like three, four hundred euros for that month and the the room was highly tempered. So we had a lot of temperature, I like a, a heated temperature in the uh, apartment. I shared the apartment with uh, two other guys and they weren't very happy because once somebody decided to uh, dry their hair, boom, the electricity went off. <laughs> <laughs> of course oh god Damn, yeah or man. somebody decided to to do the uh the um what is it like hoovering the carpet or the, the floor oh god. boom electricity went off and of course the wi-fi as well internet everything right people were skyping and then suddenly boom so yeah that's when i stopped doing it man and uh i really missed out on a huge opportunity there and the one bitcoin that i had I had it on a, uh, not on my, my personal wallet, but I had it on oh, uh, no. a platform that then got, ha then got hacked and it's gone. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, God, man. So that's my that backstory of, the, of this beautiful Bitcoin. I had to ha sell the hardware with the loss and uh, I didn't touch it until recently again. And I bought a couple of uh, Cardanos or whatever. So um, what is your background with do, uh, cryptos? Do you, do you want to hear an even sadder story? Oh, um, oh yeah, I'm not sure whether I'm prepared. So, 
No, I was uh, I was in Singapore in 2011, uh, and I was invited out to eat uh, with some guys, and I met this guy called Lasse, and he wouldn't shut the fuck up about Bitcoin. Buy some Bitcoin. And he said, you know, just buy like a thousand Bitcoins. It's like a thousand dollars. It's a good investment. But I, 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 he had bought like a hundred thousand Bitcoin at that time. He is, by the way, one of the richest people in Denmark now. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not hundred. I think it was hundred thousand Danish crowns, which is like one six. It's a. He's very rich. He he could basically, you know, he's like a vest, a very rich guy. Anyway, and he said, I, I didn't listen to him. One, uh, and sorry, there you go. Uh, and then, you know, um, in January 13, I had another guy who just last just buy some Bitcoin, please. I said, okay, I'm going to take a thousand, like a thousand dollars. And I bought Bitcoin. So I got like 120 Bitcoins. Um, and that was very nice. Uh, and then they got up and suddenly I had a little bit of money, but that, that was cool. And then it crashed again. And, you know, Bitcoin is going up and down. Yeah. Now, what I have been doing the slow death, meaning that I have been selling a little bit and a little bit and a little bit at typically decent prices uh, i have had a fun with it i mean i don't get me wrong i have been doing a lot of travels a lot of fun with bitcoin uh and, and the pinnacle i even bought an apartment in denmark of it don't get me wrong it's very nice but uh if you compare 120 bitcoins at uh, the current price i would have had uh, a, very, a lot of fun um and many of my friends there because i started the danish bitcoin foundation so i met every single bitcoin geek, uh, geek back then and i was one of the one with the fewest bitcoins Many, many, men that have like thousands of bitcoins. Um, so I was in, in a group of people that today is like very, very wealthy, um, and I think that was super interesting. So my story is basically that I did the slow death of selling uh, mm-hmm. over a long time. Uh, I still have a few bitcoins left, not a, not not a lot. It's not like I can live it for the rest of my life in any means. Uh, I can, you know, uh, have a good time uh, now and then, but it's it's it's, it's quite small amounts. All right, man, that's uh, that's painful, but at the same time. I mean, you got the value from it, right? You invested a thousand euro or dollars, and then in the end, you got holidays off of it. You got an apartment. You got a bunch from it, right? But you, turn, you, you, you but you, but you turn greedy. Like everything in life. I mean, I'm also greedy as fuck. I mean, of course, I turn greedy, uh, and of course, I regret it. I don't mean, but, but I mean, I'm, I accept it. I mean, I'm so grateful for it ever happened because I, it, it was random. It happened. But all those what ifs in your mind is so easy. I was also offered to be the CEO of a Bitcoin exchange in Denmark uh, when I was 23. And you know, getting my salary in Bitcoin would that have been a good investment? Yeah, it oh, probably would. Yeah. There's so many, but, but there's so many what ifs, and it's easy. But I think I'm mostly mad about not understanding how big a wave it was. But I mean, it's it, it, it's so easy to look back, and I think in the end, you know, I'm very grateful for what I what I have with it. And I mean, I yeah. I, 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 I would lie if, if people say I wouldn't do anything different. I would uh, because uh, of course I would. Uh, yeah. But I mean, I I'm, I mean. That is my story with it. I didn't, yeah. At least I didn't lose 10,000 know, Bitcoin in a, in a dumpster or something. That, well, that happens to people, yeah. So for me, uh, I have to say that this what ifs, I, I actually had a couple of nights uh, recently, like not recent, but maybe a couple of months back, right? Where I also thought, damn, like, where it was like 50 or 60K. I was like, damn. But then at the same time, I thought, even if I had this Bitcoin right now, I well, I wouldn't even, like, even if I had it, uh, it weren't stolen from me. I wouldn't have it exactly. up till today. I would have sold it nope. at 10K or as it was at 15K or 18K, you know, and then it went down to three again and it stood there for like three years or whatever, right? It's exactly. silently exactly. waiting for the next boom. So maybe now the, what, where is it like 30K? Maybe that's the silent 3K where it was for three years. Maybe it will just sidewalk there for three years, uh, th- three years and then explode to the 300K or even a million. And, exactly. Uh, yeah, there's this. Th- do you know this guy Tech Lead, who has this million coin, million, uh, one no. million token? So this it, it's a YouTuber. Just a quick side story. It's a YouTuber who ma- made a token called Million Token, and this token um, he only created one thousand of it, not more than that. Uh, one million, I mean, uh, not more than that. And he backed it with his own money, so it was liquid uh, for one million. So it was actually worth at least a million and it went up to $200 uh, just within two weeks or so. And I was like at $5, I thought, oh man, it's uh, maybe it's just a hype, you know, like because of uh, him being this this known entity in the space and people just buying in. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. then it went up to tw- tw- 200 and I was like, uh, well, you know what? Don't even bother, Dennis, because if you're not investing there, then you're not wor- uh, you're not. Um, like you shouldn't even get the gains, so that's fine. I'm just doing that old school, building up a business, becoming millionaire this way. Plus, I think another thing we are right now we are talking about the problem of crypto. 
we have talked about money, 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 because that's what we really care about, right? We care about money. We have not talked about all the cool things we can build with crypto. Of course, we could talk about that, but we choose we just chose to talk about the money instead, and that is the problem with Bitcoin. I think there is a above fifty percent chance the whole thing is going to be a Ponzi scheme uh, with Bitcoin, and it's going to crash to zero, something like not zero, but something ridiculous low. I don't. I mean, I still hold significant bit amount of Bitcoin, but I see it as an investment where there is an, a little bit like investing in a startup. There is at least an above fifty percent is going to go to zero either because. It's going to be people just cashing out because it's a punch scheme or it's not a punch scheme, but you know, it's going to cash out or it's going to be in a regulated to death or it's going to be basically not Bitcoin who's going to be the winner. I think it's really important that you also understand that we talked about the money was the problem of crypto also. Yeah. Yeah. Saying that uh, Bitcoin is not going to be the winner. There are cr great alternatives technolo uh, technologically speaking. Yes. So um, you're... How far into it are you that you would would you know like which uh, of the, um, the the coins will probably have the best technological impact or chances? I I, I, I think if I was a VC investor, I would put my money uh, probably like forty percent Bitcoin uh, because it's a bet. I think Bitcoin is a bet in in state and current and money is not should not be the same entity. That's a political bet for me. Then I would put 40% in Ethereum because Ethereum is uh, the biggest, you know, uh, thing. And I believe they're going to release the new Ethereum that's going to make a scale. And then I would put the rest 20% in some of the smaller ones. I think that right now the most promising ones for me are uh, Solano. Solano was called the, the like this like an Ethereum competitor. And then of course Cardano uh, is also uh, quite popular. I think Uniswap is quite interesting. There are some different things there. I would probably make some smaller bets there, but I would keep a majority in Ethereum and Bitcoin. That would be my current uh, bet if I had to take it. All right, cool. Yeah, nice. And um, how ca do you know how to start an NFT? Uh, no, but I guess it's really simple if you just go to Google. All right, yeah, of course, <laughs> as it is. Because my team already came up with a bunch of ideas what we could do with NFTs, selling our content on and via NFTs and stuff like that. Exactly. It's incredible. Um, so what, what do you think about the future of crypto uh, from a technical point of view? I think that decentralized finance is going to be extremely big. Uh, I think it's going to be the, 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 like a much bigger interest than most people understand. I think in 10 years, you're never going to start a podcast or, a, a, you know, being artists or anything else without starting a token. So you, you would have like a tutorial token and that's your own token. And then, you know, even you're small and you don't have any viewers, then they are tokens are super cheap. But then as you grow, then, you know, you will have part of those tokens and you will have an excited, like you will be encouraged to share it because then, you know, more people hear about it and, and it will grow in value. I think we're going to have decentralized finance in a lot of aspects in our life. I believe personally in Bitcoin and, and, and how that money and state should be separated. I think that's going to be a very interesting uh, future, but more risky future. And I think it's more likely Ethereum is going to win because of it's, it's not requiring that to happen. It's more like a technology shift. Mm. And I think that's going to be huge in many ways. I think when you buy a car, it's going to be a token you buy on, block, on the blockchain. I think revenue sharing for... I mean, I think you're going to see a lot of these like things on the blockchain. I think everyone's going to go there eventually. All right. Very interesting. So definitely uh, still the beginning of this whole thing, of this whole development. We, have, we, have, we, have, we are still in 96 uh, when you compare to the internet where there was no Google, no Facebook, no, no, no nothing. Yeah, it's like the Wild Wild West, right? The Wild Wild West of crypto, basically. And the internet was also the Wild yeah. Wild West until 2005 or six. It really felt like you could do whatever, basically. Yeah. But I'm I'm afraid of, I'm I'm afraid about all the bubbles because people care too much about the net, the money and too little about the opportunities uh, and what it can do for things because uh, there's too many greedy people in, in crypto. That's my only concern. Okay, I see. And uh, as a developer, do you recommend getting into blockchain, smart contract development, Solidity stuff like that? When you have experience, uh, I I don't know. There's many there's many one who would disagree with me. Uh, I think blockchain developers is super difficult. It's very technical. So I think it's 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 actually pretty good because when you're in university, you're you you you're more you have more time in your hands, meaning that and it takes a long time to learn this. So I think it's it's a really good thing to get into. It's very very interesting, and I think it's it's there's a good way. many of the future, you know. I think we're back to this whole thing that is it a market risk execution risk. If you get into crypto and you start learning programming, there's a very good chance you're going to waste your time because the majority of projects are going to go to shit and go to zero. 
-hmm. If you still get a job in a scale up and there's having a very, very boring B2B product, then you're going to have a better chance of getting some warrants and get a little bit of wealthy there. And you're probably going to have a more versatile, you know, CV that works, but it depends on what you go for, because I think the biggest winners are going to, are going to be in crypto. So if you want to be the winner and it's something big, then maybe it's, it's the right thing to do. All right, cool. Okay. So then one last question. Maybe uh, maybe I'll have some sub questions for that, but one last topic, <laughs> and that is, yeah. uh, can you tell me about your, your bucket list or everyone else? Because I checked it out and I really enjoyed it. So, what is the idea behind your bucket list, and uh, would you recommend uh, to do that or for everyone to do it? And what's what's the motivation that you get from it and and stuff like that? So I think when I was 18 years old, I, uh, I I got into self development. I read all these books. I just started in the whole seduction community, reading the game and some of these like how to pick up girls. Yeah. But very quickly you realize to pick up girls, you need to be, become a cooler person. So you yeah. should actually start losing weight. You should start being interesting. <laughs> uh, and and then I realized, you know, I want the most in life. I don't want to just be a business mogul. I want to be, you know, enjoying the best of wine. I want to enjoy the best things life have to offer in all perspectives. And I think keeping a bucket list. And updating it and continue adding to it is forcing you to go for the best experiences in life. I want to see the most beautiful beaches. I want to see the most beautiful things you can. I want to ride the most expensive cars. I want to live in the most expensive apartments. And also the cheapest. I want to live in a tent. I want to go to, you know, stay in Sweden and freezing the fuck out while a bear, bear is trying to, you know, do stuff to me. I don't know. That's, that sounds weird. Um, but my point is I want everything in life. The, the, the good, the bad. And, and, and I think keeping a bucket list is forcing me to to not just do the same thing every single day. It forces me to actually encourage me to do new things. So anything for me is like I look at that list, and if I haven't crossed something on, on off in three months, I know I'm doing something wrong, right? Because that means I'm stagnating. And I think it's important when you make a bucket list, you just don't add like 50 countries like I have. It's important you have you know other things that bucket list. Try to add like learn how to cook Thai food or. You know, just something simple. Go to the local museum. I mean, it's really important that you have a versatile bucket list so you don't become a boring person who does the same thing over and over again. All right. Yeah, I like the idea of a bucket list. I, I can recall the um, there was there, this is also this great film, The Bucket List with Morgan Freeman, right? Yeah, really very good, good film. But then but they, start, they started too late, right? Yeah, they started too late. Exactly. They, start, they started when they well, he the not who was the other actor? The Jack, Jack, Jack Nicholson, I think. Nicholson, yeah, he he was the the rich guy, right? And Freeman just uh, yeah. got lucky there, got the lottery ticket basically just on his deathbed, which is exactly. what sounds weird. But um, there there is this guy, and uh, now I'm talking about something again, and yeah. I'm not really asking, but there, there is this guy uh, I found like 2011 or 12, and um, his website was something like nerdfitness.com or so. And <laughs> nice. this this guy also had a bucket list and he even had a, a leveling system assigned to it. So he always said, okay, he has this bucket list with the things that he wants to achieve and he wants to level up his life by achieving these things by, for example, nice. like doing this gives me 20 experience, doing that gives me 30 experience and so forth. And he needs 100 experience to level up, you know, and this way he... He progressed through his uh, his thingy, and he, even back then he had a list of already like fifty thousand mailing uh, mailing uh, subscribers, which was insane back then, right? So these were really interested people, and back then emailing was like super powerful, right? Now it's a little different, but two thousand eleven and twelve that was the the holy grail, yeah. So uh, I can recall that, and I even had an idea of a, for a really cool social media app with bucket lists and like rating people's um like uh ideas successes and, sharing and, and them, yeah. stuff yeah. so that was i really had this idea but i never came into uh, action so i dis that was one of the ideas that i was talking about earlier that i always had and i still think it's a cool idea i even started developing it a little bit um for ios but then realized uh that uh, it would be too much effort and the thing is like developing is just a small part the whole marketing aspect is the bigger part actually at least when you don't have a marketing person it's especially consumer apps consumer apps are expensive yeah exactly you need loads of money to market it to even get to the to the point where it's going to be used by enough people that it can work by itself right because otherwise there's no value if there's nobody else using it so you need to invest hundreds of thousands just to get to the critical mass of people using it all right back to b2b b2b businesses and dream because b2b are much easier to get started yeah exactly yeah 
All right, Lars, thank you very much for your time. Do you have anything else that you would like to share with uh, the, the uh, viewers of this video? Yeah, I think it's really important you don't um, overcomplicate things. It's very easy to get confused about all these cool frameworks and you have to learn, you know, the newest framework and you have to do things properly or you're afraid of doing some code because, you know, so you teach it to uh, yes. You have to use this, you know, the, you know, inheritance concept. Yeah, fuck that. Just get out, build some stuff. If you are very comfortable in just using the most simple PSP, a PSP and use jQuery, do that. I think it's important you just enjoy coding and enjoy the, the thing of building. Of course, then you know maybe you're inefficient, but then you will learn later, and you will and you will learn at that time. So I think don't worry too much about the technologies or you know doing things right. Just worry about get something live, and then I think in the end, when you need to learn something, you will be motivated to learn because you're dealing with that same problem over and over again, and then you'll be motivated. Same a GitHub and Git is a bitch. It's it's hard to learn, and if that's difficult, you start just having things in folders. And yes, your friends will tease you. Yes, they'll say, why are you using that? Well. You will use Git at one point in the future when you have learned it. So my point is, take it slow, just get started and enjoy. That's the number one rule. Cool. Thanks a lot, Lars. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Thanks a lot for watching this video and I hope to see you in the next one.